In this lecture, you'll learn about the domain name system, DNS. So we're back to the OSI stack here again. And when a sender composes the packet, it starts off with layer seven, the application layer, it puts that information in there. That then gets encapsulated with the presentation layer information, then the session layer information. And then we get down to layer four, where we start getting interested as network engineers, the transport layer. The packet will get encapsulated with the layer four header, which includes information like is it TCP or UDP and the port number, for example, port 80 for HTTP web traffic. Then we encapsulate that with the layer three header, which is the IP header. And at that layer, the sender has to put on the source and the destination IP address. Now, with some applications, it will actually put the IP address directly in there, but quite often it will use an FQDN, a fully qualified domain name, such as www.cisco.com. And that FQDN has to be resolved to an IP address that we can put into the package. It. So that is where DNS comes in. The domain name system resolves that FQDN, the fully qualified domain name, such as www.cisco.com, to an IP address. Enterprises will typically have an internal DNS server or a cluster of internal DNS servers, which will resolve the IP addresses of their internal hosts. For example, if I was working for an enterprise called flatbox.com, we would have our own internal DNS server, which would be responsible for resolving all hosts that were in the flatbox.com domain. However, that internal DNS server, it can't know about everything in the entire internet. It can't have the entire database there. So for anything external, it's going to need to forward those requests on to an external public DNS server. DNS requests are sent using UDP port 53, and that can fail over to TCP on port 53, but normally it's going to use UDP. So let's have a look at how DNS works in the lab. So to do that, I'm going to open up a command prompt here. So this is on my Windows host, I'll enter CMD and I'll do a IP config slash all. And you can see on the interface I'm using for the lab, my IP address is 172.23.1.10, it's a slash 24, and my default gateway, the router, is at 172.23.1.254. My DNS server is at 172.23.4.1, and the DNS domain that I'm a part of is flakboxa.lab. So let's have a look at the DNS server next. I'm using a Windows server as my DNS server. So let's have a look in server manager. I can click on tools and then open up DNS. And you can see that the server here is authoritative for the domain, flatboxa.lab. And if I click on that, you see that I've already set up address records for some hosts in there. So the host engineering A is at 172.23.6.10, B is at 6.11, Linux A is at 172.23.4.2, etc. And all these hosts are in the flakboxa.lab domain. If this DNS server received a request for an FQDN that was in a different domain, it would need to forward that out to public DNS. To configure that, if I right click on the server up on the top left here and then go properties and forwarders, I don't actually have any configured here, but I would just edit this and I would put in the IP address of a public DNS server in here. Okay, so that's the DNS setup. If I come back to my local host now, 
and I can do an ns lookup for the host of Linux A and you see it will take a second and then my DNS server is 172.23.4.1 the one I just showed you and it's resolved Linux A.flatboxA.lab to 172.23.4.2 and if I ping Linux A then the ping works just fine because it was able to resolve it. So I'll be able to ping that host either by its FQDN, its host name, or by its IP address. Okay, so that's how DNS works in a Windows environment. Let's have a look at DNS on our Cisco routers next.